Chapter 25 Amran hadn't dressed Nesta in cobwebs and stardust as Moore and I were clothed, and she hadn't dressed Nesta in her own style of loose pants and a cropped blouse. She had kept it simple, brutal. A dress of impenetrable black flowed to the dark marble floors of the throne room of the hewn city, tight through the bodice and sleeves, its neckline skimming the base of her pale throat. Nesta's hair had been swept into a simple style to reveal the pains of her face. The savage clarity of her eyes as she took in the assembled crowd, the towering carved pillars and the scaled beasts twining around them, the mighty dais and the throne atop it, and did not balk. Indeed, Nesta's chin only lifted with each step we took toward that dais. One throne, I realised, that mighty throne of those twined, scaly beasts. Rhys realised it too, planned for it. My sister and the others peeled away at the foot of the dais, taking flanking positions at its base. No fear, no joy, no light in their faces. Asriel, at Moore's side, looked murderously calm as he surveyed those gathered. As he beheld Kia waiting beside a golden-haired woman who had to be Moore's mother, sneering at us. Promise them nothing, Moore had warned me. Rhys held out a hand for me to ascend the day's steps. I kept my head high, back straight, as I gripped his fingers and strode up the few steps, toward that solitary throne. Rhys only winked as he gracefully escorted me right into that throne, the movement as easy and smooth as a dance. The crowd murmured as I sat, the black stone bitingly cold against my bare thighs. They outright gasped as Rhys simply perched on the arm of the throne smirked at me and said to the court of nightmares, bow. For they had not, and with me seated on that throne, their faces were still a mixture of shock and disdain as they all dropped to their knees. I avoided looking at Nesta while she had no choice but to follow suit. But I made myself look at Kia, at the female beside him, at anyone who dared meet my gaze, made myself remember what they had done to Moore now bowing with a grin on her face, when she was barely more than a child. Some of the court averted their eyes. I will interpret the lack of two thrones to be due to the fact that this visit came upon you quickly, Rhys said with lethal calm, and I will let you all escape without having your skin flayed from your bones as my mating gift to you, our loyal subjects, he added, smiling faintly. I traced a finger over the scaly coil of one of the beasts that made up the arm of the throne, our court, part of it, and we needed them to fight with us, to agree to it tonight. The mouth I'd painted that dark, dark red parted into a lazy smile. Tendrils of power snaked toward the dais, but didn't dare venture past the first step, testing me what power I might have but not getting close enough to offend Rhysand. I let them creep closer, sniffing around, as I said to Rhys, to the throne room, surely, my love, they would like to stand now. Rhys smiled down at me, then at the crowd. Rise. They did, and some of those tendrils of power dared climb up the first step. I pounced. Three gasps choked through the murmuring room as I slammed talon-sharp magic down upon those two curious powers, dug in deep and hard, a cat with a bird under its paw. Several of them. Do you wish to have this back? I asked quietly to no one in particular. Near the foot of the dais, Keir was scowling over a shoulder, his silver circlet glinting atop his golden hair. Someone whimpered in the back of the room. Don't you know, Rhys purred to the crowd, that it's not polite to touch a lady without her permission? In answer, I sank those dark talons in further, the magic of whoever had dared try to test me thrashing and buckling. Play nice, I crooned to the crowd, and let go. Three separate flurries of motion warred for my attention. Someone had winnowed outright, fleeing. Another had fainted, and a third was clinging to whoever stood beside them, trembling. I marked all their faces. Amran and Nesta approached the foot of the dais. My sister was staring as if she'd never seen me before. I didn't dare break my mask of bemused coolness. 
didn't dare ask if Nesta's shield were holding up, if someone had just tried to test her as well. Nesta's own imperious face yielded nothing. Amran bowed her head to Rhys, to me. By your leave, High Lord. Rhys waved an idle hand. Go. Enjoy yourselves. He jerked his chin to the watching crowd. Food and music. Now. He was obeyed. Instantly. My sister and Amran vanished before the crowd could begin milling about, striding right through those towering doors and into the gloom, to go play with some of the magical trove kept here, to give Nesta some practice for whenever Amran figured out how to fix the wall. A few heads turned in their direction, then quickly looked away as Amran noticed them. Let some of the monster inside show. We still had not told her of the bone carver, of the prison visit, Something a bit like guilt coiled in my stomach, though I supposed I had to get used to it as Rhys curled a finger toward Keir and said, The council room. Ten minutes. Keir's eyes narrowed at the order, the female beside him keeping her head down, the portrait of subservience. What more was supposed to have been? My friend was indeed watching her parents, cold indifference on her face. Asriel kept a step away, monitoring everything. I didn't let myself look too interested, too worried, as Rhys offered me a hand and we rose from the throne, and went to talk of war. The council chamber of the Hewn City was nearly as large as the throne room. It was carved from the same dark rock, its pillars fashioned after those entangled beasts. Far below the high, domed ceiling, a mammoth table of black glass split the room in two like a lightning strike, its corners left long and jagged sharp as a razor. Rhys claimed a seat at the head of the table. I took the one at the opposite end. Asriel and Moore found seats on one side, and Kia settled into the seat on the other. A chair beside him sat empty. Rhys leaned back in his dark chair, swirling the wine that had been poured by a stone-faced servant a moment before. It had been an effort not to thank the male who'd filled my goblet. But here, I did not thank anyone. Here, I took what was mine, and offered no gratitude or apologies for it. I know why you're here, Keir said without any sort of preamble. Oh? Rhys's eyebrow arched beautifully. Keir surveyed us, distaste lingering on his handsome face. Highburn is swarming. Your legions, a sneer at Asriel, at the Illyrians he represented, are gathering. Keir interlaced his long fingers and set them upon the dark glass. You mean to ask my Darkbringers to join your army? Rhys sipped from his wine. Well, at least you've spared me the effort of dancing around the subject. Keir held his gaze without blinking. I will confess that I find myself sympathetic to Highburn's cause. Moore shifted slightly in her seat. Asriel just pinned that icy, all-seeing stare on Keel. You would not be the only one, Rhys countered coolly. Keir frowned up at the obsidian chandelier, fashioned after a wreath of night-blooming flowers, the centre of each a twinkling silver phalite. There are many similarities between Highburn's people and my own, both of us trapped, stagnant. Last I checked, Moore cut in, you have been free to do as you wish for centuries. Longer. Keir didn't so much as look at her, earning a flicker of rage from Asriel at the dismissal. Ah, but are we free here? Not even the entirety of this mountain belongs to us. Not with your palace atop it. All of this belongs to me, I'll remind you, Rhys said wryly. It's that mentality that's allowed me to find Highburn's stifled people to be... Kindred spirits. You want the palace upstairs, Keir? Then it's all yours. Rhys crossed his legs. I didn't know you were lusting after it for so long. Keir's answering smile was near serpentine. You must need my army rather desperately, Rhys and... Again, that hateful glance at Asriel. Are the overgrown bats not up to snuff any more? Come train with them, Asriel said softly, and you'll learn for yourself. In his centuries of miserable existence, Keir had certainly mastered the art of sneering. And the way he sneered at Asriel, Moore's teeth flashed in the dim light. 
It was an effort to keep myself from doing the same. I have no doubt, Rhys said, the portrait of glorious boredom, that you've already decided upon your asking price. Keir peered down the table, to me, looked his fill as I held his stare. I did. My stomach turned at that gaze, the words. Dark power rumbled through the chamber, setting the onyx chandelier tinkling. Tread carefully, Keir. Keir only smiled at me, then, at Rhys. Moore had gone utterly still. What would you give me for a shot at this war, Rhysand? You hoard yourself to Amarantha, but what about your mate? He had not forgotten how we'd treated him, how we'd humiliated him months ago. And Rhys, there was only eternal, unforgiving death in his face, in the darkness gathering behind his chair. The bargain our ancestors struck grants you the right to choose how and when your army assists my own, but it does not grant you the right to keep your life, Kia, when I grow tired of your existence. As if in answer, invisible claws gouged deep marks in the table, the glass shrieking. I flinched. Kia blanched at the lines now inches from him. But I thought you might be hesitant to assist me, Reese went on. I'd never seen him so calm. Not calm, but filled with icy rage. The sort I sometimes glimpsed in Asriel's eyes. Rhys snapped his fingers and said to no one in particular, Bring him in. The doors opened on a phantom wind. I didn't know where to look as a servant escorted in the tall, male figure. At Moore, whose face went white with dread. At Asriel, who reached for his dagger, truth-teller his every breath alert, focused, but, unsurprised, not a hint of shock. Or at Eris, heir to the autumn court, as he strolled into the room. Chapter 26 That's who the final, empty seat was for. And Rhys, he remained sprawled in his chair, sipping from his wine. Welcome back, Eris, he drawled. It's been, what, five centuries since you last set foot in here? Moore slid her eyes toward Rhys. Betrayal and hurt. That was hurt flashing there. For not warning us. For this surprise. I wondered if I schooled my features with any more success than my friend as Eris claimed the vacant seat at the table, not bothering to do so much as nod to a wary-eyed Kia. It has indeed been a while. He'd healed since that day on the ice. Not a sign of the gut wound Cassian had given him. His red hair was unbound, a silken drape over his well-tailored cobalt jacket. What is he doing here? I speared down the bond, not bothering to hide any of what coursed through me. Making sure Kia agrees to help, was all reset, the words tight and clipped, restrained, as if he were still holding the full might of his rage in check. Shadows curled around Azrael's shoulders, whispering in his ear as he stared down Eris. "'You once wanted to build ties to Autumn, Kier, said Rhys, setting down his goblet of wine. "'Well, here's your chance. Eris is willing to offer you a formal alliance in exchange for your services in this war.' "'How the hell did you get him to agree to that?' Rhys didn't answer. "'Rhysand?' Kier leaned back in his chair. "'It is not enough.' Eris snorted, pouring himself a goblet of wine from the decanter in the centre of the table. I had forgotten why I was so relieved when our bargain fell apart the last time. Rhys shot him a warning look. Eris just drank deeply. What is it that you want then, Keir? Rhys purred. I had the feeling if Keir suggested me again, he'd wind up splattered on the wall. But Keir must have known too, and simply said to Rhysand, I want out. I want space. I want my people to be free of this mountain. You have every comfort, I finally said, and yet it is not enough. Keir ignored me as well, as I'm sure he ignored most women in his life. You have been keeping secrets, High Lord, Keir said with a hateful smile, interlacing his hands and resting them on the mall table, right atop the nearest gouge. I always wondered where all you went when you weren't here. Highburn answered the question at last, thanks to that attack on... What is its name? 
Valaris, yes, on Valaris, the city of starlight. Moor went utterly still. I want access to the city, Keir said, for me and my court. No, Moor said. The word echoed off the pillars, the glass, the rock. I was inclined to agree. The thought of these people, of Keir in Valaris, tainting it with their presence, their hatred and small-mindedness, their disdain and cruelty. Rhys did not refuse, did not shoot down the suggestion. You can't be serious. Rhys only watched Keir as he answered down the bond. I anticipated this, and I took precautions. I contemplated it. The meeting with the palace governors, that was tied to this? Yes. Rhysand said to Keir, There would be conditions. Moore opened her mouth, but Asriel laid a scarred hand atop hers. She snatched her hand back as if she'd been burned, burned as he had been. Asriel's mask of coal didn't so much as waver at the rejection, though Eris chuckled softly, enough to make Asriel's hazel eyes glaze with rage as he settled them upon the High Lord's son. Eris only inclined his head to the Shadow Singer. I want unrestricted access, Keir said to Rhys. You will not get it, Rhys said. There will be limited stays, limited numbers allowed in, to be decided later. Moore turned pleading eyes to Rhys. Her city, the place that she loved so much. I could almost hear it, the crack I knew was about to sound amongst our own circle. Keir looked to Moore at last, noted the despair and anger, and smiled. He had no real desire to get out of here, only a desire to take something he'd undoubtedly gleaned that his daughter cherished. I could have gladly shredded through his throat, as Keir said. Done. Rhys didn't so much as smile. Moore was only staring and staring at him, that beseeching expression crumpling her face. There is one more thing, I added, squaring my shoulders. One more request. Keir deigned to acknowledge me. Oh? I have need of the Ouroboros mirror, I said, willing ice into my veins. Immediately. Interest and surprise flared in Keir's brown eyes, Moore's eyes. Who told you that I have it? He asked quietly. Does it matter? I want it. Do you even know what the Ouroboros is? Consider your tone, Keir, Rhys warned. Keir leaned forward, bracing his forearms on the table. The mirror, he laughed under his breath. Consider it my mating present, he added with sweet venom. If you can take it. Not a threat to face him, but... What do you mean? Keir rose to his feet, smirking like a cat with a canary in its mouth. To take the Ouroboros, to claim it, you must first look into it. He headed for the doors, not waiting to be dismissed. And everyone who has attempted to do so has either gone mad or been broken beyond repair. Even a high lord or two, if legend is true. A shrug. So it's yours if you dare to face it. Keir paused at the threshold as the doors opened on a phantom wind. He said to Rhys, perhaps the closest he'd come to asking for permission to leave, Lord Thanatus is having difficulties with his daughter again. He requires my assistance. Rhys only waved a hand, as if he hadn't just yielded our city to the mail. Keir jerked his chin at Eris. I will wish to speak with you, soon. Once he was done gloating over his victory tonight, what we'd given, and lost. If the Ouroboros could not be retrieved, at least without such terrible risk, I shut out the thought, sealing it away for later as Keir left, leaving us alone with Eris. The air of autumn just sipped his wine, and I had a terrible sense that Moore had gone somewhere far, far away as Eris set down his goblet and said, You look well, Moore. You don't speak to her, Asriel said softly. Eris gave a bitter laugh. I see you're still holding a grudge. This arrangement, Eris, Rhys said, relies solely upon you keeping your mouth shut. Eris huffed a laugh. And haven't I done an excellent job? 
not even my father suspected when I left tonight. I glanced between my mate and Eris. How did this come about? Eris looked me over, the crown and dress. You didn't think that I knew your shadow singer would come sniffing around to see if I'd told my father about your powers? Especially after my brother so mysteriously forgot about them too. I knew it was a matter of time before one of you arrived to take care of my memory as well. Eris tapped the side of his head with a long finger. Too bad for you I learned a thing or two about Daimati. Too bad for my brothers that I never bothered to teach them. My chest tightened. Reese, To keep me safe from Baron's wrath, to keep his potential alliance with the High Lords from falling apart before it began. Reese, It was an effort to keep my eyes from burning. A gentle caress down the bond was his only answer. Of course I didn't tell my father, Eris went on, drinking from his wine again. Why waste that sort of information on the bastard? His answer would be to hunt you down and kill you, not realising how much shit we're in with Highburn and that you might be the key to stopping it. So he has plans to join us then, Rhys said. Not if he learns about your little secret, Eris smirked. Moore blinked, as if realising that Rhys's contact with Eris, his invitation here, the glance she gave me, clear and settled, told me enough. Hurt and anger still swirled, but understanding too. So what's the asking price, Eris? Moore demanded, leaning her bare arms on the dark glass. Another little bride for you to torture? Something flickered in Eris's eyes. I don't know who fed you those lies to begin with, Morrigan, he said with vicious calm. Likely the bastards you surround yourself with. A sneer at Asriel. Moore snarled, rattling the glasses. You never gave any evidence to the contrary, clearly not when you left me in those woods. There were forces at work that you have never considered, Eris said coldly, and I am not about to waste my breath explaining them to you. Believe what you want about me. You hunted me down like an animal, I cut in. I think we'll choose to believe the worst. Eris's pale face flushed. I was given an order and sent to do it with two of my brothers. And what of the brother you hunted down alongside me, the one whose lover you helped to execute before his eyes? Eris laid a hand flat on the table. You know nothing about what happened that day. Nothing. Silence. Indulge me, was all I said. Eris stared me down. I stared right back. How do you think he made it to the spring border? he said quietly. I wasn't there when they did it. Ask him. I refused. It was the first and only time I have denied my father anything. He punished me, and by the time I got free, they were going to kill him too. I made sure they didn't. Made sure Tamlin got word, anonymously, to get the hell over to his own border, where two of Eris's brothers had been killed by Lucian and Tamlin. Eris picked at a stray thread on his jacket. Not all of us were so lucky in our friends and family as you, Rhysand. Rhys's face was a mask of boredom. It would seem so. And none of this entirely erased what he'd done, but... What is the asking price? I repeated. The same thing I told Asriel when I found him snooping through my father's woods yesterday. Hurt flared in Moore's eyes as she whipped her head toward the Shadow Singer but Asriel didn't so much as acknowledge her as he announced. When the time comes, we are to support Eris's bid to take the throne. Even as Asriel spoke, that frozen rage dulled his eyes, and Eris was wise enough to finally pale at the sight. Perhaps that was why Eris had kept the knowledge of my powers to himself. Not just for this sort of bargaining, but to avoid the wrath of the Shadow Singer, the blade at his side. The request still stands, Rhysand, Eris said, mastering himself, to just kill my father and be done with it. I can pledge troops right now. Mother above. He didn't even try to hide it, to look at all remorseful. It was an effort to keep my jaw from dropping to the table at his intent, the casualness with which he spoke it. Tempting, but too messy, Rhys replied. Bayron sided with us in the war. Hopefully he'll sway that way again. 
a pointed stare at Eris. He will, Eris promised, running a finger over one of the claw marks gouged into the table, and will remain blissfully unaware of Feyre's gifts. A throne in exchange for his silence and sway. Promise Keir nothing you care about, Rhys said, waving a hand in dismissal. Eris just rose to his feet. We'll see. A frown at Moore as he drained his wine and set down the goblet. I'm surprised you still can't control yourself around him. You had every emotion written right on that pretty face of yours. Watch it, Asriel warned. Eris looked between them, smiling faintly, secretly, as if he knew something that Asriel didn't. I wouldn't have touched you, he said to Moore, who blanched again. But when you fucked that other bastard, a snarl ripped from Reese's throat at that, and my own. I knew why you did it. Again, that secret smile that had more shrinking. Shrinking. So I gave you your freedom, ending the betrothal in no uncertain terms. And what happened next? Asriel growled. A shadow crossed Eris's face. There are few things I regret. That is one of them, but perhaps one day, now that we are allies, I shall tell you why, what it cost me. I don't give a shit, Moore said quietly. She pointed to the door. Get out. Eris gave a mocking bow to her, to all of us. See you at the meeting in twelve days. Chapter 27 We found Nesta and Amran waiting outside the throne room both of them looking pissy and tired. Well, that made six of us. I didn't doubt Keir's claim about the mirror, and risking gazing into it. None of us could afford it, to be broken, driven mad. None of us, not right now. Perhaps the bone carver had known that, had sent me on a fool's errand to amuse himself. We did not bother with goodbyes to the whispering court as we winnowed to the townhouse, to Valaris the peace and beauty that now felt infinitely more fragile. Cassian had come off the roof at some point to join Lucian in the sitting room, the books from the wall spread on the low-lying table between them. Both got to their feet at the expressions on our faces. Cassian was halfway to Moor when she whirled on Rhys and said, Why? Her voice broke, and something in my chest cracked too at the tears that began running down her face. Reese just stood there, staring at her, her face unreadable, watching as she slammed her hand into his chest and shouted, Why? He yielded a step. Eris found Asriel. Our hands were tied. I made the best of it. His throat bobbed. I'm sorry. Cassian was sizing them up, frozen halfway across the room, and I assumed Reese was telling him mind to mind, Assumed he was telling Amran and perhaps even Lucian and Nesta from their surprised blinks. Moore whirled on Asriel. Why didn't you say anything? Asriel held her gaze unflinchingly. Didn't so much as rustle his wings. Because you would have tried to stop it. And we can't afford to lose Keir's alliance and face the threat of Eris. You're working with that prick? Cassian cut in, whatever catching up now over apparently. He moved to Moore's side, a hand on her back. He shook his head at Asriel and Rhys, disgust curling his lip. You should have spiked Eris's fucking head to the front gates. Asriel only watched them with that icy indifference, but Lucian crossed his arms, leaning against the back of the couch. I have to agree with Cassian. Eris is a snake. Perhaps Rhys had not filled him in on everything then on what Eris had claimed about saving his youngest brother in whatever way he could, of his defiance. Your whole family is despicable, Amran said to Lucian from where she and Nesta lingered in the archway. But Eris may prove a better alternative, if he can find a way to kill Baron off and make sure the power shifts to himself. I'm sure he will, Lucian said. But Moore was still staring at Rhys, those silent tears streaming down her flushed cheeks. It's not about Eris, she said, voice wobbling. It's about here. She waved a hand to the townhouse, the city. 
this is my home, and you are going to let Keir destroy it. I took precautions, Rhys said, an edge to his voice I had not heard in some time. Many of them, starting with meeting with the governors of the palace and getting them to agree to never serve, shelter, or entertain Keir or anyone from the Court of Nightmares. Moore blinked. Cassian's hand moved to her shoulder and squeezed. They have been sending out the word to every business owner in the city, Reese went on, every restaurant and shop and venue, so Keir and his ilk may come here, but they will not find it a welcoming place, or one where they can even procure lodgings. Moore shook her head as she whispered, he'll still destroy it. Cassian slid his arm around her shoulders, his face harder than I'd ever seen it as he studied Reese, then Asriel. You should have warned us. I should have, Reese said, though he didn't sound sorry for it. Asriel just remained a foot away, wings tucked in tight and siphons glimmering. I stepped in at last. We'll set limitations on when and how often they come. Moore shook her head, still not looking anywhere but at Reese. If Amarantha were alive, the word slithered through the room, darkening the corners. If she were alive and I offered to work with her, even if it was to save us all, how would you feel? Never. They had never come this close to discussing what had happened to him. I approached Reese's side, brushing my fingers against his, his own curled around mine. If Amarantha offered us a slim shot at survival, Reese said, his gaze unflinching, then I would not give a shit that she made me fuck her for all those years. Cassian flinched. The entire room flinched. If Amarantha showed up at that door right now, Reese snarled, pointing toward the foyer entry, and said she could buy us a chance at defeating Highburn, at keeping all of you alive, I would thank the fucking cauldron. Moore shook her head, tears slipping free again. You don't mean that. I do. Reese. But the bond, that bridge between us, it was a howling void, a raging, dark tempest. Too far. This was pushing them both too far. I tried to catch Cassian's gaze, but he was monitoring them closely, his golden-brown skin unnaturally pale. Azrian's shadows gathered closer, half failing him from view, and Amran. Amran stepped between Reese and Moore. They both towered over her. I kept this unit from breaking for forty-nine years, Amran said, eyes flaring bright as lightning. I am not going to let you rip it to shreds now. She faced more. Working with Kier and Eris is not forgiving them, and when this war is over, I will hunt them down and butcher them with you, if that is what you wish. Moore said nothing, though she at last looked away from Rhys. My father will poison this city. I will not allow him to, Amran said. I believed her, and I think Moore did too, for the tears that continued sliding free, they seemed to shift somehow. Amran turned to Reese, whose face had now edged toward devastation. I slid my hand through his. I see you, I said, giving him the words I'd once whispered all those months ago, and it does not frighten me. Amran said to him, you're a sneaky bastard. You always have been, and likely always will be. But it doesn't excuse you, boy, from not warning us. Warning her. Not when those two monsters are involved. Yes, you made the right call. Played it well. But you also played it badly. Something like shame dimmed his eyes. I'm sorry. The words to Moore, to Amran. Amran's dark hair swayed as she assessed them. Moore just shook her head at last, more acceptance than denial. I swallowed, my voice rough as I said, this is war, our allies are few and already don't trust us. I met each of them in the eye, my sister, Lucian, Moore, and Asriel and Cassian, then Amran, then my mate. I squeezed his hand at the guilt now sinking its claws deep into him. You all have been to war and back, when I've never even set foot on a battlefield. But I have to imagine that we will not last long if we cleave apart from within. 
stumbling near incoherent words, but Asriel said at last, She's right. Moore didn't so much as look in his direction. I could have sworn guilt clouded Asriel's eyes, there and gone in a blink. Amran stepped back to Nesta's side as Cassian asked me, What happened with the mirror? I shook my head. Kia says it's mine if I dare to take it. Apparently, what you see inside will break you, or drive you insane. No one's ever walked away from it. Cassian swore. Exactly, I said. It was a risk perhaps none of us were entirely prepared to face. Not when we were all needed. Each one of us. Moore added a bit hoarsely, straightening the ebony pleats and panels of her gossamer gown. My father spoke true about that. I was raised with legends of the mirror. None were pleasant, or successful. Cassian frowned at me, at Rhys. So what? You are talking about the Ouroboros, Amran said. I blinked. Shit. Shit. Why do you want that mirror? Her voice had slipped to a low timbre. Rhys slid his free hand into his pocket. If honesty is the theme of the night. Because the bone carver requested it. Amran's nostrils flared. You went to the prison. Your old friend says hello, Cassian drawled, leaning a shoulder against the sitting room archway. Amran's face tightened, Nesta glancing between them, carefully, reading us, especially as Amran's quicksilver eyes swirled. Why did you go? I opened my mouth, but the gold of Lucian's eyes caught my attention, snared it. My hesitation must have been indication enough of my wariness. Jaw tight with a hint of frustration, Lucian excused himself to his room. Frustration, and perhaps disappointment. I blocked it out. What it did to my stomach. We had some questions for the carver. Cassian gave Amran a slash of a smile when Lucian was gone. And we have some for you. Amran's smoke-filled eyes flared. You are going to unleash the carver. I simply said, Yes. A one monster army. That is impossible. I'll remind you that you, sweet Amran, escaped. Rhys counted smoothly, and have stayed free, so it can be done. Perhaps you could tell us how you did it. Cassian had stationed himself by the doorway, I realised, to be closer to Nesta, to grab her if Amran decided she didn't particularly care for where this conversation was headed, or for any of the furniture in this room. Precisely why Rhys now placed himself on Amran's other side, to draw her attention away from me, and more behind us, every muscle in her lithe body on alert. Cassian was staring at Nesta. Cassian was staring at Nesta, hard enough that my sister at last twisted toward him, met his gaze, his head tilted, slightly, a silent order. Nesta, to my shock, obeyed, drifted over to Cassian's side as Amran replied to Rhys, No. It wasn't a request, Rhys said. He'd once admitted that merely questioning Amran had been something she'd allowed him to do only in recent years, but giving her an order, pushing her like this. Feyre and Cassian spoke to the bone carver. He wants the Ouroboros in exchange for serving us, fighting Hyben for us, but we need you to explain how to get him out. The bargain Rhys or I would strike with him would suffice to hold him to our will. Anything else? Her voice was too calm too sweet. When we're done with all this, Rhys said, then my promise from months ago still holds. Use the book to send yourself home, if you want. Amran stared up at him. It was so quiet that the clock on the sitting room mantel could be heard, and beyond that, the fountain in the garden. Call off your dog, Amran said with that lethal tone, because the shadow in the corner behind Amran that was Asriel, the obsidian hilt of the truth-teller in his scarred hand. He'd moved without my realising it, though I had no doubt the others had likely been aware. Amrin bared her teeth at him. Asriel's beautiful face didn't so much as shift. Rhys remained where he was as he asked Amrin, Why won't you tell us? 
Cassian casually slid Nesta behind him, his fingers snagging in the skirts of her black gown, as if to reassure himself that she wasn't in Amran's direct path. Nesta only rose onto her toes to peer over his shoulder. Because the stone beneath this house has ears, the wind has ears, all of it listening, Amran said, and if it reports back, they will remember, Resand, that they have not caught me, and I will not let them put me in that black pit again. My ears hollowed out as a shield clicked into place. No one will hear beyond this room. Amran surveyed the books lying forgotten on the low table in the sitting room. Her brows narrowed. I had to give something up. I had to give me up. To walk out. I had to become something else entirely. Something the prison would not recognise. So I... I bound myself into this body. I'd never heard her stumble over a word before. You said someone else bound you, Reese questioned carefully. I lied. To cover what I'd done, so none could know. To escape the prison, I made myself mortal. Immortal, as you are, but... Mortal compared to... To what I was. And what I was... I did not feel the way you do, the way I do now. Some things, loyalty and wrath and curiosity, but not the full spectrum. Again, that far away look. I was perfect, according to some. I did not regret, did not mourn and pain. I did not experience it. And yet, yet I wound up here because I was not quite like the others, even as... As what I was, I was different, too curious, too questioning. The day the rip appeared in the sky, it was curiosity that drove me. My brothers and sisters fled. Upon the orders of our ruler, we had just laid waste to twin cities, smote them wholly into rubble on the plain, and yet they fled from that rip in the world. But I wanted to look. I wanted. I was not built or bred to feel such selfish things as want. I'd seen what happened to those of my kind who strayed, who learned to place their needs first, who developed, feeling. But I went through the tear in the sky, and here I am. And you gave all that up to get out of the prison? Moore asked softly. I yielded my grace, my perfect immortality. I knew that once I did, I would feel pain, and regret, I would want, and I would burn with it, I would fall. But I was, the time locked away down there, I didn't care, I had not felt the wind on my face, had not smelled the rain, I did not even remember what they felt like, I did not remember sunlight. It was to Asriel that her attention drifted, the shadow singer's darkness pulling away to reveal eyes full of understanding locked away. So I bound myself into this body. I shoved my burning grace deep into me. I gave up everything I was. The cell door just unlocked, and so I walked out. A burning grace that still smouldered far within her, visible only through the smoke in her grey eyes. That will be the cost of freeing the carver, Amran said. You will have to bind him into a body make him fay, and I doubt he will agree to it, especially without the Ouroboros. We were silent. You should have asked me before you went, she said, that sharpness returning to her tone. I would have spared you the visit. Rhysand swallowed. Can you be unbound? Not by me. What would happen if you were? Amran stared at him for a long while. Then me, Cassian, Asriel, Moore, Nesta, finally back to my mate. I would not remember you. I would not care for any of you. I would either smite you or abandon you. What I feel now, it would be foreign to me. It would hold no sway. Everything I am, this body, it would cease to be. What were you? Nesta breathed, coming around Cassian to stand at his side. Amrant toyed with one of her black pearl earrings. A messenger, and soldier, assassin, 
for a wrathful god who ruled a young world. I could feel the questions of the others brewing. Reese's eyes were near glowing with them. Was Amran your name? Nesta asked. No. The smoke swirled in her eyes. I do not remember the name I was given. I used Amran because... It's a long story. I almost begged her to tell it, but soft footsteps thudded, and then... Oh! Elaine started, enough so that I realised she couldn't hear us. Had no idea we were here, thanks to the shield that kept sound from escaping. It instantly dropped, but my sister remained near the stairs. She'd covered her nightgown with a silk shawl of palest blue, her fingers grappling into the fabric as she held herself. I went to her immediately. Do you need anything? No, I... I was sleeping, but I heard... She shook her head, blinked at our formal attire, the dark crown atop my head, and resands. I didn't hear you. Asriel stepped forward. But you heard something else. Elaine seemed about to nod, but only backed away. I think I was dreaming, she murmured. I think I'm always dreaming these days. Let me get you some hot milk, I said, putting a hand on her elbow to guide her into the sitting room. But Elaine shook me off, heading back to the stairs. She said as she climbed the first steps, I can hear her, crying. I gripped the bottom post of the banister. Who? Everyone thinks she's dead, Elaine kept walking, but she's not, only different, changed as I was. Who? I pushed. But Elaine continued up the stairs, that shawl drooping down her back. Nesta stalked from Cassian's side to approach my own. We both sucked in a breath. To say what, I didn't know. What did you see? Asriel said, and I tried not to flinch as I found him at my other side, not having seen him move. Again. Elaine paused halfway up the stairs. Slowly, she turned to look back at him. I saw young hands wither with age. I saw a box of black stone. I saw a feather of fire land on snow and melt it. My stomach dropped to the floor. One glance at Nesta confirmed that she felt it too. Saw it. Mad. Elaine might very well have gone mad. It was angry, Elaine said quietly. It was so, so angry that something was taken. So it took something from them as punishment. We said nothing. I didn't know what to say, what to even ask or demand, if the cauldron had done something to her as well. I faced Asriel, exposing my palms to him. What does that mean? Asriel's hazel eyes churned as he studied my sister, her too thin body, and without a word he winnowed away. Moore watched the space where he'd been standing long after he was gone. I waited until the others had left. Cassian and Rhys slipping away to ponder the possibilities, or lack thereof, of our would-be allies, Amran storming off to be rid of us entirely, and Moore striding out to enjoy what she deemed as her last few days of peace in this city, a brittleness still in her voice, before I cornered Nesta in the sitting room. What happened at the Hewn City, with you and Amran? You didn't mention it. It was fine. I clenched my jaw. What happened? She brought me to a room full of treasure, strange objects, and it. She tugged at the tight sleeve of her gown. Some of it wanted to hurt us, as if it were alive, aware, like, like in all those stories and lies we were fed over the wall. Are you all right? I couldn't find any signs of harm on either of them, and neither said anything to suggest. It was a training exercise, with a form of magic designed to repel intruders. The words were recited. As the wall will likely be, she wanted me to breach the defences, find weaknesses. And repair them? Just find the weaknesses. Repairing is another thing, Nesta said, her eyes going distant as she frowned at the still open books on the low table before the fireplace. I sighed. So, that went right at least. Those eyes went razor sharp again. I failed. Every time. So no, 
it did not go right. I didn't know what to say. Sympathy would likely earn me a tongue lashing. So I opted for another route. We need to do something about Elaine. Nesta stiffened. And what solution do you propose exactly? Letting your mate into her mind to scramble things around? I'd never do that. I don't think Reese can even fix things like that. Nesta paced in front of the darkened fireplace. Everything has a cost. Maybe the cost of her youth and immortality was losing part of her sanity. My knees wobbled enough that I took a seat on the deep cushioned couch. What was your cost? Nesta stopped moving. Perhaps it was to see Elaine suffer while I got away unscathed. I shot to my feet. Nesta, don't bother. But I trailed her as she strode for the stairs, to where Lucian was now descending the steps and winced at the sight of her approach. He gave her a wide berth as she stormed past him. One look at his taut face had me bracing myself and returning to the sitting room. I slumped into the nearest armchair, surprised to find myself still in my black dress as the fabric scraped against my bare skin. How long had I been back from the hewn city? Thirty minutes? Less? And had the prison only been that morning? It felt like days ago. I rested my head against the embroidered back of the chair and watched Lucian take a seat on the rolled arm of the nearest couch. Long day? I grunted my response. That metal eye tightened. I thought the prison was another myth. Well, it's not. He weighed my tone and crossed his arms. Let me do something about Elaine. I heard from my room everything that happened just now. It wouldn't hurt to have a healer look her over, externally and internally. I was tired enough that I could barely summon the breath to ask, do you think the cauldron made her insane? I think she went through something terrible, Lucian countered carefully, and it wouldn't hurt to have your best healer do a thorough examination. I rubbed my hand over my face. All right, my breath snagged on the words. Tomorrow morning, I managed a shallow nod, rallying my strength to rise from the chair. Heavy, there was an old heaviness in me, like I could sleep for a hundred years and it wouldn't be enough. Please tell me, Lucian said when I crossed the threshold into the foyer, what the healer says, and if, if you need me for anything. I gave him one final nod, speech suddenly beyond me. I knew Nesta still wasn't asleep as I walked past her room, knew she'd heard every word of that conversation thanks to that fey hearing, and I knew she heard as I listened at Elaine's door, knocked once, and poked my head in to find her asleep breathing. I sent a request to Madja, Reese's preferred healer, to come the next day at eleven. I did not explain why, or who, or what. Then went into my bedroom, crawled onto the mattress, and cried. I didn't really know why. Strong, broad hands rubbed down my spine, and I opened my eyes to find the room wholly black, Reese and perched on the mattress beside me. Do you want anything to eat? His voice was soft, tentative. I didn't raise my head from the pillow. I feel heavy again, I breathed, voice breaking. Reese said nothing as he gathered me up into his arms. He was still in his jacket, as if he'd just come in from wherever he'd been talking with Cassian. In the dark, I breathed in his scent, savoured his warmth. Are you all right? Reese was quiet for a long minute. No. I slid my arms around him, holding him tightly. I should have found another way, he said. I stroked my fingers through his silken hair. Reese murmured, If she... His swallow was audible. If she showed up at this house, I knew who he meant. I would kill her. Without even letting her speak, I would kill her. I know. I would too. You asked me at the library, he whispered, why I, why I'd rather take all of this upon myself. Tonight is why. Seeing more cry is why. I made a bad call, tried to find some other way around this shithole we're in. 
and had lost something. More had lost something in the process. We held each other in silence for minutes, hours, two souls twining in the dark. I lowered my shields, let him in fully, his mind curled around mine. Would you risk looking into it, the Ouroboros? I asked. Not yet, was all Reese said, holding me tighter. Not yet.